Hey guys, today I got my microphone out. I am recording this for my podcast too, so if you'd rather listen so you can do other things like walk your dogs, that's what I do, or drive around, you can just search for Fancy Scientist in um, anywhere you can get podcasts or just go to fancyscientist.com and find the links there. Today, we are talking more about elephants. Last time, I talked about how I came up with my research questions. Um, So I'm a wildlife biologist, if you're new to this channel, and my channel is all about empowering scientists with information like this, and also inspiring people to conserve the natural world. So last time, I talked about how I chose my research questions about uh, forest elephants, and today, I'm going to talk more about the logistics of setting up the project that I did for my dissertation research starting in 2006. So let's get right into it. Okay, so I had my research questions. Just to briefly recap, I was going to be studying the social structure of African forest elephants. And I was doing this through behavioral observations, so watching the elephants, finding elephants, identifying the individuals, and taking note of which elephants were observed with one another. And then I also had a genetic component to this to see if the individuals who were associating with one another were were closely related to each other. And then also to see if the genetic patterns without any social observations. So um, basically seeing if close, if, if um, dung samples that were more related to each other than by chance. So the individuals, not that the dung's not related, but the individuals that the dung comes from um, in closer geographic um, um, distance. So. Basically, if elephants were uh, who were more related to each other, or elephants who were more physically closer to each other, if they they weren't were more related to each other, and we would predict that they would be based on what we know about African savanna elephants. So now I had my questions. And as I mentioned previously, African forest elephants are extremely difficult to study because they are very hard to see. They live in the forest, and this forest uh, obscures your vision from seeing them. It's really hard to get close to them. So there's really only two sorts of places that you can work to study forest elephants in Central Africa. Um, So the first one I mentioned are buys, and these are large clearings in the forest. They're natural clearings. They have mineral deposits in them. They have rich, they have soil that contains a lot of salt, especially. So the animals come, they ingest the soil. There's often water there too. And they, um, yeah, ingest the the minerals from the soil, and they they therefore maintain this openness of the by because there's all these trails leading into the by, and um, just the animals all trampling over the same area over and over again prevents vegetation from growing there. So elephants use these these buys. Um, a lot of ungulates. You'll see gorillas there. It's it's not just for elephants. These buys are incredibly useful or incredibly important to many species within Central Africa. The other types of areas where you can study forest elephants are savanna clearings within uh, forest elephant range and, f- and forest elephant habitat. So there are some some national parks that have savannas where you can see the elephants openly. Um, and these parks still have a lot of forest in them too. So usually they're mosaics of savanna and, and forest intermingled um, in between them. Okay, so I had to choose a field site. I was my advisor's first PhD student, so she had worked in West Africa previously, in Ghana, and in Ghana, in um, the, the parks that she's she worked at, it was impossible to study the elephants there in the way that I wanted to study them. They all lived in these forest habitats. In fact, she actually never even saw an elephant when she was doing her field research. She was collecting dung samples to estimate the population size of the elephants there. And like I said, she didn't see them the the whole entire time she was doing her studies. 
So I needed a park that was really different and my advisor, um, she had some connections, but, but she didn't have an existing uh, long-term park that we had been working in. So I just, we had to start from the ground up and my advisor was very, very helpful in, in this situation. So we worked alongside um, our colleague at the Wildlife Conservation Society. WCS has a big presence in Gabon as, as well as um, WWF does too. Um, and um, we weren't actually exclusive to Gabon at this part. We um, were, we decided to check out parks in the Republic of Congo and Gabon. So we planned for a trip to visit these sites and to see which one would be best for the research. I wanna explain all parts of this research to you guys because I know that when I gave that talk at University of Montana, a lot of people had questions just about how I set it all up. So we obviously needed money to, uh, to visit these field sites. So my advisor did have uh, startup funds that come with being a new advisor. And then I also applied for uh, grants within the university system. So we had a grant um, specific to projects involving conservation and African forest elephants are an endangered species. Um, or now, now they are considered one. At the time, they're still subspecies, but anyway, they're, they're endangered um, regardless of the species designation. <laughs> So we had planned to visit three different parks. We were going to go to the uh, Republic of Congo to visit Ozala National Park. We were going to go to Gabon to visit Avindo National Park and uh, Lope National Park was our last one. So we flew into Congo I, so if, you're, so if you're thinking about Congo, um, whenever I thought of Congo, I would, I would think of the country formerly Zaire, um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And this is the country that has Okapi and Bonobos, and um, they also have the mountain gorillas as well. Um, so this is not the country that we went to. And people, people often think of, of that country as being um, dangerous or has been, I mean, it, which, is, which is true. There has been a lot of um, civil unrest there that, that makes it uh, more difficult to travel to and, um, and definitely unsafe in certain areas. But we were going to the Republic of Congo. Um, so I just didn't know that much about this country at all. But I had worked in Africa before, I'd worked in Kenya, and while I was in Kenya, I also visited Uganda and Rwanda. Um, so I, I, felt, I definitely felt comfortable going to these different places. But um, my experience in Congo was, was definitely interesting, um, or at least my research trip, and it was something that I had never done before. So we actually tied this trip in with another elephant researcher. So she was also starting her PhD at about actually the same time as me. Um, she was in um, the UK. Um, her name is uh, Vicky Fishlock. She's actually an elephant researcher at the Ambicelli um, Research Trust in Kenya, where she works with Cynthia Moss, who has studied uh, um, African savanna elephants for decades. So, um, so she lives in Kenya and does really cool research there now. So she was actually starting her field work. In Europe, they tend to move a lot faster with their PhDs. Um, they just have less time than we do in the United States. So we went with her to check out the park that she was working in, which was um, Odzala National Park in the northeastern section of the country. Now, my experiences in Kenya visiting national parks were they they were remote, um, so you you would have to take a, a vehicle to get there, and obviously like a four wheeler vehicle, you can't just take a car um, unless you're in Nairobi National Park. Although um, I still think you would need four wheel drive there. 
But anyway, so in Kenya, it's it's really, the parks are really accessible. Yes, you probably have to go on a, a dirt road, a bumpy road, but um, pretty much when you fly into Nairobi, you can access the parks by, uh, by road. But um, in Congo, this um, was not the case for Odzala. Um, we actually had to first take a plane. Um, I don't remember where we flew into. I'm sure if I looked at a map, I could figure it out. But we we had to fly for um, a couple of hours to the more northern part of the park where we would then get on a boat ride. So this was a several day journey. And when I say a plane, this is a very interesting plane. Um, this was so this is a flight uh domestically so within congo and the plane looked kind of fun on the outside um so i just i don't know i didn't like really think anything of it i um saw the plane and i remember it had like this collage of animals on on the outside and it was like you know jungle life and like marine life and i just remember how pretty it looked and then when we went inside the plane, I started panicking deep down inside, to tell you the truth. I, the, the plane was like just nothing I had ever been in before. So the seats were, were made up of kind of like this tiger print, kind of like a, like a, like a cheesy design from the seventies. And the luggage, a lot, I think maybe not all of it, but there was a, a, a large percentage of the lug luggage was in the um, stored t near the front of the plane. So in front of us where we sat and um, it was loose. Like there wasn't anything really holding it back. It was just piled up. So we got in our seats and they did have seat belts, but it just, it just did not feel the same like an American, a domestic American flight, or even domestic flights that I had taken. Um, actually, I, I never took a domestic flight to Kenya. I guess I took international flights um, to Rwanda. So um, yeah, I just never experienced anything like that before. So I was nervous the whole entire time on the plane. And my advisor comforted me. She reminded me um, that the WCS people took this plane all the time, that you know people took this plane all the time, every single day, it ran every single day. Um, so that made me feel a little bit better. And then once the plane it took off, um, it was a, a propeller plane, so you know, it made a lot more noise. Um, I do remember just seeing like all this canopy cover um, over Congo, just so much areas where I know that there was development in them, but just so much forest. So um, we ended up making it okay. The plane descended and everyone clapped at the end. This is, this is what people um, do a lot in um, developing countries, even, even on flights that seem more normal. A lot of people clap at the end, um, you know, telling the pilot that, that they did a good job. So the plane ride was over. That night we stayed in a, a very rural town. And at the time I was a strict vegetarian. Africa in general is not friendly towards vegetarians. At least, at least the the countries that I have been to, it's just a very meat heavy country. Um, they mostly eat goats and beef, and, and with a couple of side vegetables, and then usually a starch. So in this. And it, and it is especially weird for a Westerner to ask for a vegetarian meal because um, we're perceived as, as being rich and meat is more expensive and they don't understand why somebody wouldn't want meat when, when we could afford it. So I had asked for a vegetarian meal and there was no vegetarian meal at all. And the um, the person, the chef at the hotel, um, made me a can of peas, <laughs> like 
<laughs> like sauteed and I ate a lot of manioc, which is, um, it's really delicious. I really like it. Um, it's this like ground up, um, cassava, I think it is. I think it's cassava. And, um, it's, it's kind of like, it's kind of, I think it's maybe like fermented. I don't know if you know this, please let me know and I'll correct it in, a, in another episode. Okay, so manioc is cassava, and the way that they prepare it, it it ends up being like kind of like baked but gooey. I don't know. It's, it's hard to explain. Um, kind of like spongy, but it's good. So I ended up eating a lot of manioc and peas because that's all I had for dinner. And that it, later that day, my stomach because we actually know we actually had a full day in that town because um the researcher we were with vicky she needed to purchase supplies and get organized so we get organized so we were there for a day so the previous night i had manioc on peas and the next day i remember we were buying the supplies in town and my stomach started to feel dodgy i was I was starting to feel sick and i asked to lay down in the car in the back seat of the car when we got back for the night, later that night, I basically threw up and the whole entire night and um, had issues in the bathroom as well. Um, and the hotel was, it was, um, it had, it was, it was very um, like open, so you could hear easily between the walls and there was, um, open spaces at the top of the hotel. Anyway, I was very sick and everyone could hear me vomiting throughout the night. Luckily, it just lasted throughout the night and the next day I was fine and ready to go. So then we had a car ride that was several hours long and um, this was super cool because for the most part we didn't see anything, but we did see a gorilla cross the road. Um, it was fast, but it was just so cool to, to see that moment. And we were driving to um, the river so that we could then take two boat trips to get to Odzala National Park. Now, when you think about boat trips, you, you know, probably imagine using a motorized boat, boat, um, yeah, I mean, that's what you imagine. Um, but this was, um, very simple. It was basically a dug out, it was a, a gigantic tree trunk that was dug out and there were chairs just sitting in it. So like, you know, just like lawn chairs that you buy for your deck. Um, so again, this seemed like a little sketchy. It seemed like, is this safe? And we would just, you know, people would just be mostly, mostly we would be following the current. Um, but we would also be paddling as well or not us, but the, but the guides on the boat. And it was just really interesting to see like all of Vicky's field gear packed into the boat because she had, you know, really nice cameras and recorders to take notes. And she had all these action packers, which are these like really large trunks full of this material. And it was just like all sitting in this boat, which I was sure could easily over, over, overflow or fall over sometime during the trip. But Anyway, it didn't happen and we had to do this twice. So there were two boat rides and they were each like six to eight hours long. Um, so this was also a really cool and honestly enjoyable experience. I, one of my favorite rides at Disney World when I was younger was the Jungle Cruise. And if you've never been there, it's this, it's a boat ride um, that takes you through, um, areas of Africa and Asia and you get to see animals along the way obviously they're anim or they're animatronic maybe that's not obvious um so this made me think about that and we did see animals we didn't see any forest elephants but we saw some forest buffalo um in the water as as we um took our boat ride and that was super cool as well some points of the boat ride, the the water was so shallow that we had to get out and we had to walk the boat through the river um, so that we could make it uh, across so we could keep on our journey. When we finally got to Odzala National Park, I really couldn't believe how beautiful it was. And not just in terms of like the park, it was, you know, gorgeous park, but 
also there was like this this nice field station built there it was and I was just like it's it's amazing considering how remote this park is how um supplies um seem to come in but there it was a it was a beautiful field station um it looked pretty new it actually was nicer than some of the field stations I'd been to in the United States when I worked at the Bureau of Land Management so once I got there, I felt so much better and I felt so excited about this park. So the next step in Odzala was to look for areas where I could find elephants and get the dung from them. So we were really focused on buys. And we, the next day, we got up and went with guides to the largest buy at Odzala. And Odzala, um, there's like a lot of palm trees and um, some of the soil was also sandy. So we took this walk, um, I don't know, maybe several kilometers um, through the hot sun, definitely some savanna grasses. And we entered, yeah, we, were, we were mostly in the savanna and then we entered this tall savanna though, with high grasses. And then we entered this area, you could see it from the distance, this, um, what, we, what, what I, we ended up calling bo bosques of forest. So it's kind of like an island of forest in, enveloped by savanna area. And this is where we presumed the forest elephants would be. So we had to approach this by very cautiously because you don't know what's in the by. And elephants in this area are actually very dangerous. Um, so my experiences working with elephants in Kenya were, was mostly that they were very um, kind elephants towards researchers and tourists. And um, you would be driving along elephants would be attempting to cross the road so you could just like literally park your vehicle and they would just go right by your car un unfazed um, and they just yeah were very friendly they didn't charge you they didn't charge vehicles there are exceptions males who are in must would will charge vehicles this is an accelerated state of um, high testosterone where um, when they start to um, breed so it's kind of like um, rut in in deer but in central africa a lot of these elephants are really heavily poached they're really skittish they run away um, so you have to be really careful entering areas where you can't see because they can easily charge you we therefore waited back while the guides started to enter this by and we heard this really loud thunder and like initially it shocked us and then you could hear just like it's just like this thunderous sound and the guys whispered to us that that were elephant that those were elephants so there are elephants in the by as we were approaching the by to investigate the site so that was definitely a good sign when we entered the by um, we obviously made sure the elephants were no longer there um, we did see evidence of um, definitely lots of old dung. It was a gigantic buy. There had actually been an old platform there. Um, we needed, so we needed a platform as well if we were working in a buy because I needed a high area from where I could see the elephants, observe them safely, and um, try to notice where the dung fell so I, can, so I could attribute individual dung to individual elephants. So we were in the by and um, it was just very cool. Like, like I said, lots of old elephant dung and another really cool thing was we saw um, African gray parrots, which are a really popular pet. Although I don't, I don't agree with having them as pets because when you see them in the wild, they're incredibly social. Um, parrots are incredibly smart animals. So I think it's really um, honestly quite cruel to keep them in cages for the rest of their lives. Um, so it was, just, it was just amazing to see these birds fly wild in, um, in this park. It was so great. So we went back um, that night and um, we slept in tents um, and 
throughout the night. We slept in canvas tents, so these are not like set tents that we set up. It's like safari tents. Um, and it was very nice and very comfortable. Definitely, we heard a lot of animal activity at night. Animals, I, we heard animals crashing in the river, splashing. I'm not sure what happened, but anyway, um, it was a really fun stay. So we stayed there for a couple of days to get a sense of how many elephants we could likely see there. The field station was located in a savanna area and we only saw ele elephants once. So we did see um, a forest elephant. Um, it was probably a male because it didn't have any young with it and it was um, eating around the savanna edges. So that again was another promising sign. But the next day um, we left and we did our boat journey again. We took the two long boat rides back. Again, this was super fun for me and now I felt a whole lot more comfortable doing it. And then I had my plane ride again. This plane ride going back felt a little bit better. There were no Tiger C airplane seats this time, Tiger print airplane seats. Um, it, the plane looked more um, traditional, but there was no air conditioning and um, we just had to wait in the plane to, for everyone to come in. And I remember just sitting there dripping and dripping in sweat. During my experiences doing field work um, and traveling to Africa and being in Kenya, I learned to be incredibly patient and to deal with um, just uncomfortable things like that. So we were very hot. I remember we, were, we had papers and we were trying to cool ourselves off. But once the plane took off, it was fine. Um, and I did feel more comfortable on this flight because of my past flight and just like I said, the plane looked a lot better. People still clapped at the end and um, that was it. I didn't have to take any more domestic flights within Congo. So that was my first field site that I visited and I was happy that we had some promising signs with forest elephants, but the trip out there was not not um, the best for us, was not really what we wanted, just because it took such a long time to get out there. So we were really hoping that the other field sites would be better. For the next two field sites, we had to take a flight to Gabon. Um, so we flew into Libreville, the capital of the city, and then again, we would have to have several long journeys ahead of us. The first one we were going to, the first park we went to, was a Vindo National Park to visit Langwe Bai. This is um, a more famous bai. It's kind of similar to Zanga Bai. It's, it's very large and open. So we took a train ride from Libreville to, I don't remember which town, um, to get to a Vindo. We also had to take another car ride, and then um, a window was tucked away, or the field station within a window um, where the buy was, was tucked away within the forest, so we had to take a small hike there. It wasn't too bad. Um, the field assistants wanted to carry our gear for us, um, but I did insist on taking my backpack. I wanted, I wanted to, um, to prove myself. I was a wildlife biologist now. Again, when we went to see the field station in a window, I was just shocked at how cool the field station was and how nice it was. So we were here in the forest and there had been this like, there was like this rock, um, this really flat rock and they build the field station on top of that. And this is also a tourist um, place as well. So not only researchers came here, but tourists, um, stayed in um, the the like cabins there to visit Langue Bai. The striking thing about Langue Bai was that in Congo we had to move very slowly through the forest, or at least we didn't even actually really enter the forest. We mostly went in the savanna, going up to a forest bosque. But here in in Avindo National Park, we actually moved pretty swiftly. Um, and it turns out that the elephants just aren't that aggressive there um, and people just didn't have to worry about them that much, which um, was very different from the elephants I experienced in the other parks. So the next day, we 
woke up and we were going to go to the bai. And the bai was a short walk from the field station. When we got to the bai, I was blown away and so happy, so excited. It was so cool, it was so magnificent. So Langwe Bai, there had been some elephant research there before, but especially a lot of gorilla research. There, had, there was a very formal platform built there with, with several decks, I think at least two decks, and researchers would go there um, nearly every day and watch the gorillas. So they had ways of identifying them, from, especially from their nose patterns. And there had been, like I said, some preliminary elephant research there too, where people were starting to identify the elephants. So we stayed on this platform um, all day. I stayed there. I think my advisor went back um, for part of the day, but I stayed there all day. And just to get a sense of like how frequently the elephants came and how many there would be, how easy it would be to get dung from them. So within half an hour, an hour, we saw our first elephant group. And it's just so amazing because there's this huge clear area surrounded by forest. Um, I'm really bad at distances, but larger, maybe two football fields open. And you could just see the elephants come from a distance and then come to the center of the by and just start ingesting the soils, drinking the water. Um, and it was just such a peaceful, beautiful thing to watch. I stayed there the whole day and we saw other elephant groups. Um, at one point we saw a gorilla, uh, which was super cool to watch. Um, I don't remember if it was a him or her, but um, actually it was a him because it was a silverback. And he um, was in the by ingesting the soils and it was just super cool to watch it was amazing to watch so with Langue Bai, I was elated. I was like, this is the perfect place for me to conduct my forest elephant research. I could see the elephants coming. I could um, identify them easily from the platform. I would be safe. And I also thought that I would be able to watch the elephants defecate and then be able to take notes and, and assign which dung came from which individual. So we stayed at um, Avindo National Park for a couple of days and I just felt so good about this park. I was really confident that this was going to be my field site. Then the last site that we visited was Lope National Park. Lope National Park is a fairly large park, but really people only see the northeastern part of the park. And this park was also attractive to tourists. Um, so in Lope Town, there is a hotel where tourists stay, mostly um, European tourists, especially French, because um, Gabon and Congo were former French colonies. So another um, added challenge to my field work is that, uh, or to my field sites, was that everyone spoke French. And I took Spanish in high school, so it wasn't that easy for me to get used to. I'm also horrible at languages, they don't come to me naturally, um, so that was another challenge. But anyway, we went to Lope, um, and we did have, um, we did stop at the hotel one day, um, and it was, it was funny, to, it felt so funny to be there in field clothes, and especially after our experiences in Odzala National Park, which were so remote. And they had a pool in Lope, and um, this, it, it, a gorgeous view along the river. But this is not where the field station was. Actually, the field station was in a better place. So um, we went to the field station, which is, it's not that far away from Lope Town, but it takes a while. It takes at least a good solid half an hour because the roads are so bad. And uh, we went to the field station. 
This field station, honestly, was the nicest out of all of them, I think. Um, it was it was made up of a central area, and then there were different cabins where researchers stayed. There were cabins for um, offices as well that even had air conditioning. Um, so this was a luxury, but honestly, it was really to protect the equipment, the computer equipment. And um, also, they had an herbarium there, so it was to protect the samples. But again, it was a nice luxury to have. Um, and there was a permanent director there, so I would feel very safe. I would feel, um, I also had someone guiding me in my research, um, because she had her PhD as well. Forest elephant research had been done there before, some preliminary stuff. Um, there have been two researchers there photographing the elephants. Um, and so we drove around um, Lope to get a sense of the park. I don't think we spent much time at Lope. We did, we did see forest elephants. Um, the, the problem with Lope is that it didn't really have a lot of good buys. Um, and this is, we were really set at working at a buy. So um, talking to the director, we knew that there were um, several small ones that we could choose from, but um, I didn't have a sense of what they looked like. We didn't have a lot of time uh, looking at, at these, or we didn't actually take any time to look at the buys. Um, we just mostly explored the park. Another really cool thing we did in Lope was that the WCS was attempting to habituate mandrels. Um, so this is one of the few areas of the world where you can see mandrels and um, they had tracking devices on the mandrels. So I went out with a team of researchers to try to find them and then um, obviously see them. This again was such a cool experience. Um, mandrels gather in groups as large as thousands of individuals. Um, and when we went, I remember having to duck under branches and, um, you know, cause you have to follow the mandrels so they don't necessarily always go on easy trails. Um, so I remember just having to be fast and, and move through the forest and, and us bushwalking through the forest. We mostly heard them, but I did see some flashes of mandrel, but they were very hard to see, um, but I was still happy that I saw them. So we left Lope National Park, we went back to the United States, and it was really clear to me that uh, Vindo National Park was where we wanted to work. It just seemed like the perfect park for me to work at and um, that was just such an ideal setup. I was so excited about my research and I was ready to begin. So back in the United States though, before I began my field work, I had to prepare. I had to get funding to support the costs of me staying at the field station and in these countries. Gabon is actually a really expensive country to work in. They import a lot of stuff. So the field station costs are actually not that different from hotel costs here in the United States. I had to get permits so that I could conduct my research in Avindo National Park and um, I just had to better develop my plan with um, my advisor and just make sure all these things were set and then also book my trip and actually start my field work. So that's where I'm gonna end off today, um, but make sure you subscribe so you get the next episode because I'm gonna talk about those things that I did to get my field work started, how nothing went to plan <laughs> <laughs> or almost nothing went to plan. All A lot of things got changed um, around and how I dealt with it and how I adjusted. Um, one of the major rules in science is that things will always go wrong. So you've got to have some backup plans. Um, so make sure you subscribe to not miss those episodes. Um, and I have a lot more stories from the field, a lot of stories about elephants. We're really just beginning my field journey. 
So thank you guys so much for listening. Um, please um, comment if you have any questions. You can reach out to me on social media. I am the fancy scientist everywhere. Um, I love to hear back from you guys about any questions you have or topics that you want to talk about, want me to talk about. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye.